All righty, thank you, Junior, for leading us in a great time of worship. Um, my name is Christian Baker. Um, in case you all don't know me, uh, I work on staff here at Scotts Hill. My wife, Kelly, is sitting over there. So <laughs> Garrett has given me the opportunity to preach the Word of God here to you tonight. And so that's what we're going to do. And before we dive into today's scripture, I want us to start off with a story. And it's a story about a lion named Christian. And so this isn't some sort of story about my life at all. We just happen to have the same name. But anyway, in 1969, Christian was born at a zoo in England. He was born in a zoo, and his, his mom, his mother lion, uh, abandoned him. Apparently that's what mom lions do sometimes. I don't know why. But he was abandoned by his mother, and so the zookeepers had to take care of him and so they had to nurture him for a time um, but after a while he became too much for them to handle and so he sold the zookeeper sold him to a department store i don't know why that happened and what kind of department stores they have over in england wouldn't you love to see that though like just go into a, like walmart and there's a lion it's kind of sad though right like you're gonna see this thing all caged up so anyway, a couple of guys with the name John and Ace saw Christian and they wanted to buy him. They wanted to purchase him so they could have a lion of their own. Wouldn't you love to have a lion? <laughs> so they purchased him and they brought him back to their flat in England, which I guess is like an apartment in England. They have flats. Yep. <laughs> and so... They had him, and they really loved Christian the lion. He was a really great lion. He was very well behaved. He was a great cub. He was very tame because he wasn't born in a natural wild place where lions were born, so he was very well behaved. He didn't have a lot of those natural instincts that lions would normally have. Um, but after time, he grew bigger and bigger, as lions naturally do, right? So a friend of theirs came to them and said, you need to really just rehabilitate Christian back into the wild because England is not the place where lions are supposed to be, right? They're not supposed to live in a city. They're not supposed to live in an apartment. They're supposed to live in the wild and do lion stuff. So they agreed, despite the fact that they loved Christian. But what they had to do first is they had to bring him to the, the countryside to, to train him up to know how to be a real lion, to be a wild lion. But yeah, there he is right there. <laughs> and so they trained him up. And he was able to run around a little bit, but he was still timid. He was scared of even scarecrows. He's kind of like the lion on the Wizard of Oz. He had no courage. Um, so after a while, though, he was able to be trained and then brought to Kenya. And after several years, John and Ace, they wanted to see Christian again. So they went to Africa and they found him. And it's, it's a really heartwarming video if you, have time, if you have the time to look it up ever on YouTube. But Christian the lion recognizes them and he's like running towards them and gives them this big old lion hug. It's, it's, it's really, really sweet to see. And so Christian the lion, after John and Ace were there, he hung out with them for a little bit. But eventually he went back to his pride. He went back to the other lions that he was supposed to be with. You know, it must have been a really hard decision for John and Ace to make to give up Christian the lion. I mean, wouldn't you want to keep the lion that you got as a cub? Um, but they knew it was the right decision because lions are not meant to live in England. They're not meant to live in London. Their true home is in Africa, doing lion things, killing hippos, uh, hunting their prey and running around, doing all kinds of lion stuff. Like I said before, this story is not a story about myself at all, but you could see it being symbolic of the Christian life in general. You see, we all who are Christians, we're born into this world, this fallen, broken, sinful world, and, and we're, we live here for a time. However, God has prepared for us a better home. Just like Christian, his better home was in Africa. It was not in England. Uh, our better home is with God in heaven, in the heavens. And because God has prepared our true home, we must live by faith in God's promise of eternal life. God has promised us eternal life. Because God has prepared our true home, we must live by faith in God's promise of eternal life. Our scripture today is 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10. If you want to pull that up or you can read it on the screen. But let's go ahead and read through the verses. 
For we know that if the tent that is their earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has, give, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be a away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I thank you that we have such great hope. Uh, I, I thank you for giving us this promise of eternal life with you in heaven. Um, I thank you for your son, Jesus, um, for, for his life, death, and resurrection. I thank you, God, because he lived a perfect life and died uh, on our behalf, God. We can be reconciled to you, and we can have eternal life with you in the heavens, Lord. God, I pray, um, Lord, that you would speak through this message. Lord, you would speak through your scripture as it is your words. Uh, Holy Spirit, you speak through your word. And God, I pray that you'd also bring conviction of sin tonight. Uh, I pray that people would respond in repentance and that they would seek to want to honor you because of this great promise, these great promises that you have given us, Lord, as your sons and daughters. And Lord, I, I pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So last week... In chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, Garrett talked about our suffering in this present age uh, and how God allows us to suffer for our own growth and to show that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. He also made the point that although this life we live now is difficult, what awaits us in the life to next is an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, beyond all imagination, beyond our most wildest dreams. And our text today brings us to focus on the life in the next, this, this glory, on what happens after we as believers die. And it brings us to understand the hope that we have for life after death. We have been granted eternal life because of the work of Jesus Christ and his life and his death and resurrection. And the first point I have for us is that we are promised a better home. We see this right in the text. Let's read the first section again. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we see right off the bat just this imagery of a tent. Paul understood tents very well. Um, according to Acts 18.3, Paul himself was a tent maker. That was his job as he was on missionary journeys throughout um, the Mediterranean. He, he made tents. He set up tents. And he understood very well the purpose of tents. And I'm sure you do too. Tents are made to be temporary. They're to be brought up and then torn down. They're only meant to be, to be there for a certain amount of time. However, what Paul is saying is that our building, our new home, will be made by God, eternal in the heavens, not made by hands. So our new home is not going to be like a tent that's temporary. It is going to be permanent. Um, last week at college night, I was having a conversation with, with some of the guys, Andrew, Paul, and Elijah, and Skyler. 
Um, and we were talking about a little bit about Hurricane Florence, and that just brought to mind just the fact that w when storms come here, we a lot of times have maintenance to do, right? We get damage, and some, some people's houses were even very destroyed. Um, but most of us here had some kind of repair to do, either on our homes or our family's homes, or helping out our friends um, in varying degrees. But that's not what our heavenly home is going to look like. Our heavenly home is going to be permanent, made by God, not made by human builders. It's going to be permanent. And in this world also, our bodies, our, our physical bodies, as these, this is our home as well, um, we get sick, we get injured, we get tired, we just get worn out. We groan, as Paul says. Paul says, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. We long to put on our heavenly dwelling as Christians. We long for the day in which we can put off this, this fragile body uh, and, and take on our heavenly permanent dwelling. Um, and for Paul, it was really easy to see that his life was difficult. Um, he says in chapter 4, he speaks of his, of his difficulties. He says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. And Paul understood suffering very, very well. Um, but I wonder in our lives, are we looking forward to our eternity in heaven to a greater degree than we're looking forward to the things in this world. Um, I wonder, do some of us have things like bucket lists, like things that we would just really love to get done before we die? Um, are there things in your life that you would like to do uh, uh, before you die? Like maybe you want to travel or you have some kind of goal that you just wish you could get done before you die because you value those things. And, and having these desires is not bad, but what we should really desire is to dwell with God in heaven. We should really have that at the forefront. And I can speak of my own failure in this. You see, when me and Kelly were dating and engaged, I really, really wanted to be married, right? Marriage is not a bad thing, but I even had it in the back of my mind that I really just wish that, you know, Jesus would hold off and coming back again, you know, before I get married. Um, so I could experience the joys of marriage, and I just wish that I'd be married before I die. But you see, that's, that's wrong. You know, marriage is not bad. Marriage is a great thing. But we should really desire to be with God above all else. We should have that, that correct ordering of desires, that God should be our ultimate desire, dwelling with him in heaven, away from this body. Uh, Paul displays this ordering of desires well in Philippians 1, 21 through 23. He says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. It's a lot easier to think this way, to have these correct orderings of desires when things aren't going well for us. Sometimes we get down, at, like down in the dumps when our life is not going too well, when we're struggling with certain things and we're just like, God, you could just take me now and be, I'd be happy. Or, Jesus, come back, please. And that's really easy. And you should, to some degree, yes, you should think that way. Yes, and it, but it's a lot harder to think that way when our life is going good. When things are going really well in our life, when, when we're fulfilling our goals that we have, or our job is good, our relationships are good, it's a lot harder to really desire to be with God more than it is to live in this earth and to have all these, these worldly things. And I think it's especially easy for us who, who live in the United States. Um, you know, all of us have varying experiences. Some of us have had harder lives, but I think for people who live in the United States, it's especially hard because we have so much opportunity. We have so many great privileges as citizens of the United States. Um, we're, not, we're generally not really persecuted as of now. Uh, we have pretty solid lives. Um, and again, some of us have had harder lives than others, but we can attest to this just by the fact that we're here. We're in a nice AC building. You can go to the bathroom anytime you want. We have nice facilities, but that's not like how it is everywhere. And so for us in the United States, it's easy to have this incorrect order of desires. 
Uh, it's easy for us to be fine with living in this world because it's comfortable. Colossians 3, 1 through 3 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We are to seek the things where Christ is, not the things of this world. <laughs> and just like Christian the lion, as I told you before, we can become so focused on the ease of this life, Christian didn't even understand that his better life was in Africa. He was ignorant of that. He was probably happy living in England with John and Ace. We can be so focused on the ease of this life sometimes that we can become ignorant of the mm -hmm. adventure awaiting us in our true home, our true home with God in heaven. And although we can be at times ignorant of our future with God in heaven, God has, by His grace, given us His Holy Spirit as a guarantee. Paul says in verse 5, He who has prepared us for this very thing, being eternal life, is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. We have been guaranteed by God giving us His Spirit. And another way of thinking about this idea of being guaranteed is thinking about uh, the Holy Spirit as being our seal. You see, during the time that Paul wrote this, it was in ancient Roman times. And in ancient Roman times, wax seals were used to be put on documents um, to prove that the documents were official and binding. So let's say like the emperor is wanting to send a document to someone else in the government far away. He put a seal on it so that people would know that it's his and that it's official and that it is binding. So it, what, God, what Paul is saying here is that we can be assured of God's promise of eternal life because of the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit is our seal and our proof of salvation. The Holy Spirit indwells in us as believers. Um, and as Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus says it is better that he would leave, that he would depart from his disciples. That's hard for us to imagine. We'd love it if Jesus was just standing here right here. But Jesus said that it's better that I leave because then you're going to have the Holy Spirit. You're going to have God dwelling within you. Um, and because we have been sealed with the Spirit's indwelling in us, we can trust God's promise of providing for us a better home. We can trust his promise. And this truth that we are promised a better home in heaven that is everlasting and with God leads us to the second point, that we are promised a better courage. We are promised a better courage in this life. Verses 6 and 7 say, for, for we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord for we walk by faith and not by sight. And because God has promised and, and guaranteed our eternal future by giving us his Holy Spirit, we are of good courage. We have courage that no matter what happens to us in this, in this life, we will be guided by the Holy Spirit. And that even when we die, we will be brought to a better life in the next. And again, to this point, I often fall so short. I often look, to, look at the world around us and, and I, I get scared of all the division and the chaos that goes on in our world. I often get fearful. Um, there's so many things to just be frightened of in this world. However, this fearful thinking only happens for a short amount of time. For God in His grace guides me back to His Word by His Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit reminds me of the words of Christ where He says in John 16:33 says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you ha will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world with all of its troubles. Our time in this world is only a light momentary affliction. It's only momentary, but God has prepared for us something glorious and eternal in the heavens. And not only are we to have courage to not be scared of this sinful world, but we can have courage to stand on God's word as well. 
We can have courage to proclaim God's truth to our friends, our family members. We can proclaim the gospel boldly. We can stand up in our classrooms, our, in our Zoom calls. Uh, we can stand up to our professors, uh, whoever it may be, because we know that we have no reason to fear. What can man do to us? Even if, even if the worst thing would happen, which would be they desire to murder us, which I don't think that would happen here, but we would die and we would be in heaven. So what can we possibly have to fear? What could we possibly have to fear? And, and in this life, while we are in fact away from the Lord, as Paul says we are away from the Lord, we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Right now, it's, it's hard to see what's, gonna, what's going to become of us in, in the life of the next because we look around and what we see with our eyes is a broken and fallen world. But we are to walk by faith. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Although we haven't seen it, we are assured of our eternal life by God giving us His Spirit as our seal. We are to focus on our eternal life. We are still here on earth and in our bodies, uh, and so we, it's hard to see it, but we are to have faith in e- our, our eternal life and in having the Spirit as our seal. And does this mean that we are to neglect doing anything good in this life? It, does this mean that, oh, because we have eternal life, I can just sit in my, my, in my room and just read my Bible all day because nothing I do matters on this earth? No, this is not the point. <laughs> This is, this is clear in our third point, which is that we are promised a better motivation. We are promised a better motivation for living this life. Because before we came to Christ, we had certain motivations. Before we came to Christ, we had motivations to do selfish things, to seek for selfish gain, for selfish ambition, um, for selfish goals. Um, we had, we had uh, motivations that were not pleasing to the Lord. Um, we were motivated by, by, by things that were not of God. Um, but verses 9 through 10 say, So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Our motivation is to please the Lord. Our motivation in this life is to worship the Lord for what He has done for us. He has given us eternal life. He has been so kind and gracious to us that uh, He sent His Son to die for us on the cross. And so we should be led to worship for what God has done for us. But not only should God's love and promises and His promise of eternal life lead us to worship and be our motivation, but we should also be motivated by the fact that we will have to stand in judgment before Christ. If you're like me, this might seem a little confusing, right? Because we know that we are saved by grace, by faith. There's nothing that we can possibly do to earn our salvation. Our salvation is not from our works. We can't work hard enough to earn our salvation. It's only through Christ. And we also know that there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. So what does this mean? This Why are we going to be judged? So it's a little troubling, but what it is, is our works are our evidence of our faith. As James says, our faith apart from works is dead. You see, it's not our works that earn our salvation, but it's our works that are our evidence of faith. It's the things that we do in this life that are evidences of our faith. And so think about it this way. Um, say, Malachi, you claim to, to love basketball. And I said, well, what's your favorite team? And you said, oh, I don't know. I don't know any teams. And I said, who's your favorite player? And you said, I don't know any players. Say, you're a liar. You don't actually like basketball. That's ridiculous. You don't know anything about basketball. You don't like watching it. In the same way, if if we say we believe in Jesus, but do not live it out, what evidence do we have to believe in Jesus? What evidence could we possibly have? This is where works come in. Works are our evidences of our faith. If we say we believe in Christ, why don't we do what he says? Um, John writes about this coming judgment that every single person on earth is going to have to face. He writes about this in Revelation 20. He says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, 
and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. You see, our works are the evidence of our faith in Jesus. And Christ Jesus is going to look at what we have done in the, in the body and see and try to look for evidence for, for our faith in him. He's going to judge us on this throne. So this causes us to reflect back in our lives. Are we living lives that show evidence of our faith? Are we living for Christ daily? Are we taking up our cross daily? Are you following the words of Jesus? Jesus asked this question. He asks, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Why do we call Jesus Lord, Lord, and do not do what, what he tells us? We don't want to be in that situation of Jesus asking us this question. We want to be good and faithful servants. Um, we do not want Jesus to say to us, depart, depart, you workers of lawlessness. We do not want that to happen to us. We want Jesus to be pleased with us. Um, and again, our salvation is not earned by what we do. It is through faith that we are saved, but our works are the evidence of our faith. And I hope for all of us here today, we are encouraged by this better hope, and we are encouraged to live lives that please God because of his great graciousness and his great promises that he's given us. He's promised us eternal life, a better home with him in the heavens. And I know that the, the, the Holy Spirit is, is, brings conviction to us, and, and I just pray that we would respond to that conviction. Um, Maybe this understanding of, of judgment was a wake-up call for, for some of us to start pleasing the Lord. Maybe some of us aren't really at that place where we are living out our faith. And I, I hope that this is a time where you can kind of see that, oh, I need to step up and start living out the faith I claim to have. I, start, I need to start doing what Jesus has commanded me to do. Um, so as, as we kind of wrap up for tonight's message, I want us to just take some time and reflect. And we're going to sing a final song, and this song is, is Lord, I Need You. And it's a song where, where I just encourage you to take some time uh, and, and confess your sins to God. Uh, confess your sins and, and repent and turn from those sins and ask for his help. Ask for his help um, in guiding you um, to honor him. Because we can only put to death these sins that are in us by the power of his Holy Spirit. We can't do it in, in and of ourselves. We need to ask God for help. Um, so honoring God in this life is all part of living by faith. And, and to live by our faith in God's promise of eternal life means for us to have a better home, a better courage, and a better motivation. We have a better home, a better courage to live this life, and a better motivation for honoring the Lord. All right, let's pray. And then we're going to sing. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for the great promises you've given us. You've given us great promises of eternal life um, because of what your Son has done for us, God. And, and uh, maybe for some of us here tonight, Lord, um, we, are brought, we have been brought to a place of conviction. Um, Holy Spirit, you have convicted us of our sins. God, I pray for, for these young adults here, Lord, tonight, that they would respond um, in repentance. Um, they would respond um, to your grace by confessing their sins and, and seeking to please you, seeking to honor you with their lives um, because of your graciousness and your love for us. Um, God, I pray that people would turn to you. And I thank you for this word you've given us tonight. I thank you for your scriptures. And God, I, I pray that we would seek you. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.